Greetings, everybody. Gleekon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. Um, we're going to do chapter 17, uh, which will, uh, after completing this, will be about three quarters of the way done with this last book in the trilogy. Um, where we left off, they everything's kind of convening now above the Well of Eternity. Um, the old gods are... They have their, their little devious fingers are in every pie, and... Um, Illidan is possessed by them, basically. Sargeras is being manipulated by them. Um, the demon soul is corrupted by them. And as they try to open a portal that will let themselves in the world and or possibly Sargeras, um, some demons and things came underway. So stay a while and listen to this one. Here we go. Ajara had been primping herself. Oh, it was not that she was not already perfection incarnate, even she knew that much. But that, for once the queen had found someone worthy of more effort. My lord Sargeras is arriving, at last one fit to be called my husband. That is a thrice highlighted line that Ajara wants Sargeras as a husband. Not for a moment did Ajara question the sanity of her convictions. She who had mesmerized her subject was herself mesmerized by the Lord of the Legion. At that moment, a tremor shook the palace. It was not the first to do so. Pulling herself from the splendid view in the mirror, the queen spun around. Vaj? Vaj, what is responsible for that awful racket? Her chief handmaiden came rushing in. A feeble attempt by rabble to stop the inevitable. So reports Captain Veroth in O Light of Light. And what is the dear captain doing about this insult to my ears? Lord Manoroth has given to him and his hand-picked soldiers appropriate mounts. The captain is already on his way to deal with the miscreants. So all is proceeding as it should. There will be no delay of our lord's arrival. Lady Vaj bowed elegantly. None that Lord Manoroth foresees. The rabble batter uselessly at the spell. Splendid. Queen Ajara went back to admiring herself in the mirror. There was really nothing else she could do to further enhance her beauty. The silken gown trailed behind her over the marble floor, its gossamer design leaving very little unrevealed. Her luxurious hair was piled high in glittering star diamonds, illuminated by their own inner light decorated in strategic locations. Another tremor struck. This one much nearer. Ajara heard cries from the direction of her handmaiden's quarters and saw cracks spread across the wall there. See if anyone is injured, Vaj, she commanded. As the latter moved to obey, the ruler of the night elves added, And if so, please relieve her of her duties and send her back to her family. I will accept nothing but utter perfection from those who would surround me. I, light of lights. A distasteful frown greeted Ajara as she looked again to the full-length mirror in the opposing wall. The queen immediately imagined greeting her lord Sargeras. That brought back the smile. There, now we just have to wait a little longer. She continued to survey herself, dreaming of the world that she and her new mate would create. A world as perfect as her. A world worthy of her. Malfurion shook his head, trying to clear it of the vertigo he had suffered during Ysera's tumble. It amazed him that he even had a head left to shake, considering that more than once the druid had been hanging by his hands over the gaping hole at the center of the darksome well. What happened? he asked, not realizing that he repeated Krasis' own query. Ysera told him much the same as Elekstraza had the mage. The night elf listened with sinking heart, to come so close only to have their hopes dashed so quickly. Then he, like Ronan and Krasis, saw the, <coughs> excuse me, saw the horrific forms rising up from the city. Malfurion saw that soldiers rode astride the abominations which resembled bats formed from shadow. He knew without a doubt that Captain Verothen would be leading the sinister band. Sure enough, a moment later, the druid made out the familiar figure of the scarred officer. Sword out, Barothan shouted something to those behind him. Immediately, the soldiers broke up into three groups, one for each flight. Only then did Malfurion see that he had terribly underestimated their numbers. There had to be at least three bats for every dragon. Alexstrasza wasted no time. The red dragon unleashed a stream of fire which went through the foremost monster and continued on finally fading. Even the soldier riding the beast looked unfazed. That's impossible, Malfurion gasped. Impossible. Yes. Ysera's eyes moved back and forth rapidly beneath her shut lids. 
There is a fault in our perspective of these fiends. What do you mean? That they are not quite as they appear to be, nor are they where they seem. Yet if that was the case, Verothan and his soldiers made for very tangible illusions. Two of the shadow creatures fixed onto Brox's mount, tearing at her wings. The bloody scores that they made in her hard-scaled hide were proof enough as to their deadliness. Yet when the bronze sought to strike back, her attacks went for naught. Isera, too, fell prey to them. One flew past her throat, raking it with curved black claws that were a part of the wing. Blood dripped from the red wounds. Isera snapped at the wing, but her bite only found only air. I know where they must be, growled Isera, for one of her rare times losing her patience. But when I wish to strike, they are no longer there. To make matters worse, one in particular now fixed upon Malfurion and the Aspect, the beast carrying Captain Barothan himself. I thought I spied you, sneered the scarred night elf. Slippery as your brother, I warned them. I knew he couldn't be trusted. Malfurion had no opportunity to ask what Barothan meant by his words, for the next second the captain and his unholy mount were upon the druid and the dragon. A fetid smell engulfed Malfurion, and even Isera wrinkled her nose. Intangible to their attacks this horror might be, but its stench was so powerful that the druid felt as if struck by a fist. A mocking laugh was all that warned Malfurion of the captain's lunge. Rothan's blade stretched impossibly, darting for the other night elf's unprotected chest. Tipping to the right, Malfurion avoided the sword, but nearly lost his grip. As he clutched tight, Rothan attacked him again. Isera could do nothing, for the inky form of the bat creature all but enveloped she of the dreaming. At the same time, a second monster snagged the, the dragon's hind legs. Something that Cenarius had taught him suddenly came to mind. Reaching into a pouch, the druid removed a small prickly seed. Unlike those he had used against the Burning Legion in the past, this one had points too delicate to wreak any havoc on the foe. However, they were especially adept at sticking to anything with which they came into contact. He tossed out two to the heavens, and through his casting the two became four, then became eight, sixteen, and doubled accordingly in rapid succession. We couldn't possibly double sixteen, it's too hard. Within a heartbeat, hundreds filled the air, then thousands. They did not as they should have cling to the dragons or Malfurion's comrades, for that was not the druid's desire. Rather, he sought to use them to find out the truth about their adversaries. The first ones passed through the bat creatures, but curiously others began sticking to empty space. More and more quickly followed suit. Shapes began to form, shapes creating quite a revelation. The secret of the shadow bats finally lay revealed. The monstrous mounts of the soldiers shimmered constantly, disappearing from sight every few seconds and reappearing elsewhere almost instantly. The fight then would still prove tricky, but now the defenders had a far better idea of where to strike, and that was all that they needed. Perhaps because the bronze female was part of the aspect of time's flight, she reacted quickest. With great gusto, the dragon seized upon one bat and materialized just within reach. Her swiftness astounded Malfurion, as did her savageness. She ripped through what passed for a stout neck on the creature, then sent it and its frantic rider hurling into the black void below. Dumb! At the angry epithet, Malfurion looked over his shoulder to find Captain Verothan almost upon both his and Ysera's back. The scarred night elf thrust, and this time managed to scrape the druid's leg, his thigh stinging Malfurion through the first thing that he could pull from a pouch. His adversary sneezed, and so did his hideous mount. Taking advantage of the distraction, Isera dove into the monster, biting and tearing with such abandon that no semblance of her superior intellect remained apparent. She was pure beast, fighting with the same primal fury as her foe. But the shadow creature was not defenseless. Its claws were still as sharp as the dragon's, and its long fangs looked more than able to pierce hard scale. With a strange, keening cry, it met Isera eagerly. At first, the two riders could do nothing but hold on for their lives. Malfurion tried to concentrate on a spell, but the jarring movements of the two combating behemoths made that impossible. Ysera batted with her tail at the second creature near her hind legs. A lucky strike sent the beast flying back, giving the dragon, at least for the moment, a more even combat with Verothan's mount. The captain had sheathed his sword and now drew a dagger. Suspecting that Verothan was quite skilled at tossing such a blade, Malfurion kept low. The officer grinned darkly, patient despite the di their dire situation. Ysera's body jerked. The druid looked down and saw that the second beast had returned, and a third followed close behind. He shouted a warning to the dragon. With a roar, the green leviathan used her incredible wings to throw herself from her opponent. The act caught both the monster and Verothan by surprise. It also enabled Ysera to turn on her second attacker. 
Wings still, she dropped upon the bat and rider, catching both under her immense girth. Her claws ripped to shreds the seed-coated wings, and she bit deep into the squat neck. With a harsh squeal, the monstrosity went limp in her claws. Isera immediately discarded the carcass, letting it fall toward the well. Of the soldier, Malfurion could see no sign, and the druid had to assume he had been slain when the first dragon had landed atop the pair. As the green leviathan pulled away in order to orient herself, the night elf caught brief glimpses of the others. Three bat creatures harassed Brox and the bronze. Even as Malfurion watched, the orc buried his axe in the shoulder of the nearest with remarkable effect. The enchanted weapon cut through whatever bone and sinew there was and exited the other side. The monster veered off awkwardly, barely able to stay aloft. The bronze, however, did not let it escape. She breathed once at the fleeing figures, and both rider and mount transformed from menace to decayed corpses that a moment later crumbled to dust. The mad wind quickly scattered the decomposing fragments over the dark waters. But if several of the bats were gone, so too were some of the dragons. Only one other green male still flew, and one of the bronzes was also missing. Also among the survivors had bleeding wounds that, with what they had suffered from the lightning barrage, had to be debilitating. Oh, others among the survivors. But worse, Malfuria knew that so long as they had to deal with their foes, they could do nothing about the demon soul in the portal. Already the vast males from below had taken on a noticeable greenish hue at its edges, one too akin to the flames of the Burning Legion to be coincidence. The demon soul, he shouted. We have to do something about it. The portal's nearly complete. I am open to suggestions, mortal. If you can also tell me how to be rid of these pests at the same time. A fiery burst briefly illuminated their surroundings. Malfurion caught the last vestiges of a burning bat dropping into the well. Directly above it flew Alexstrasza and Krasis. The druid could sense the mage's handiwork in the devastation. Given time, the band would defeat Verothan's fighters, but by then it would be too late. Even if it would not be, they had already seen that the combined might of Isera and Alexstrasza was not enough to break the defenses surrounding the disc. Something else would have to be done, but what? Dragons and bats continued to swoop past. The odds were more even, were more even than before, but still not enough to enable them to concentrate at all on the de on the demon soul. The shadow bats continued to harass each of the dragons. One of the reds, already dripping from several bites, fell under assault by a pair of the fiends. Another bronze bit through the wing of her assailant, but the monster had its fangs deep in her shoulder. Ronan and Krasis continued to cast spells of varying success, and Brox cut expertly at whatever foe came within reach. An ebony form darted past. Malfurion thought it one of the bats, but then saw the familiar reptilian outline of a dragon. He glanced away, then jaw dropping, looked back again. It was indeed a dragon, but a dragon as black as the demonic creatures that they fought and with iron plates bolted to his side. Deathwing. They had thought that they could keep his beloved creation hidden from him. They had dared think that he would not eventually find out where it had been taken. Their audacity enraged him. Once Neltharion had his glorious disc back, he would punish all of them. The world would be better off with no one but dragons, and only dragons who understood matters as he did. Called by the soul, Neltharion had flown across the swirling well, totally oblivious to what was happening. Everything else was of secondary importance. All that existed for the black dragon was the disc. He flew past both Isera and Alexstrasza, giving them but cursory glances. With the disc, he would bring them down, then add them to his consorts. Their power would add to his as was only right. The soul floated serenely ahead as if waiting patiently for him to rescue it. Neltharion's monstrous visage stretched into a wide anticipatory grin. They would soon be reunited. Then a force struck the black with such might that Neltharion was tossed back among the combatants. He collided with one of the bat creatures, sending its rider screaming to his death. Neltharion roared in outrage at the unexpected attack. Seeking a focus for his intense anger, he seized the stunned bat and tore it to shreds. When that did not assuage him, he turned his baleful gaze on the disc, searching with his heightened senses for that which held him from his prize. The spellwork he detected around the soul was intricate, very intricate, and vaguely familiar in some aspects, yet Neltharion could not put together the voices in his head with that which now confronted him. Even when those same voices now began urging him away from his desire, the dragon could not conceive that he had been someone's dupe. Neltharion shook his head, driving away the voices. If they spoke against taking the disc, then they were no more to be trusted than Alexstrasza and the others. Nothing, absolutely nothing mattered other than retrieving the soul. And so the huge black dove in again. 
but like before he was repelled as if nothing of consequence. The dragon fought not merely the power wielded by the voices, but also that of the Lord of the Legion. With a roar mixing outrage and pain, Neltharion spun far beyond the battle, finally coming to a halt at the very northern edge of the well. Fighting his agony, the furious giant glared at the storm-wrecked center. He would not be rejected again. Whatever spells his enemies had cast around the soul, he would tear through them. The disc would be his, and then all of them would pay. The Burning Legion struggled, struggled against the overwhelming might of both the dragons and the host. Doom guards swarmed the Leviathan, seeking to bring them down by lance. Nathrazim and Eridar cast monstrous spells, but they were caught between defending against the dragons and fighting the Moon Guard. The warlocks could not do both. They perished more often than they slew, mostly under the unyielding flame of a Leviathan's breath. Yet throughout it all, Archimon revealed no uncertainty. He understood that what happened here now had no relevance save that the mortals and their allies would be distracted until the coming of his lord Sargeras. Archimond accepted that he and Manoroth would be punished for their failure to prepare Kalimdor properly for their master, but that was as it should be. All that mattered now was to play the game a little longer. If that meant the deaths of more Felguard and Eridar, then so be it. There were always more, especially waiting to march in behind Sargeras. But that did not at all mean that Archimond simply watched and waited. If he was to be punished, he would vent some of his well-hidden fury on those who had caused it. The giant demon raised his hand, pointing toward a bronze dragon hovering above the legion's right flank. The dragon had been systematically ripping apart warriors below, digging through them the way a burrowing animal would soft earth. Archimond made a grasping gesture. The distant dragon suddenly quivered and then every scale tore from its body. Blood spilling from everywhere, the flayed giant bellowed in shock, then dropped among its victims. Demon warriors immediately flowed over the unprotected body, thrusting with their weapons until the dragon lay lifeless. Unsatisfied, Archimond looked for another victim. How he wished the night elf Malfurion's storm rage had been among the host. The druid had cost him much in their previous encounter, but Archimond sensed that Malfurion was one of those who had flown toward the well. Once Sargeras came through, the druid would suffer a far worse fate than even Archimond had planned for him. Still, there were so many others upon which to vent himself. Expression cold and calculating, the archdemon fixed upon a band of the bullmen he had heard called Torin. They had the potential to become splendid additions to the Legion's ranks, but this particular group would never survive to see that glorious day, or the end of their world either. They were winning. They were winning. The dragons had made the difference. Jared knew that. Without them, the host would have fallen. The demons had come across the one force that they could not defeat. True, some dragons had perished, one just in a most grisly manner, but the host pushed forward, and the demons fought in more and more disarray. Still, he was bothered. The demons' confusion was no trick this time, that he knew, yet he would have expected something more from Archimond. Some masterful regrouping. Archimond, though, seemed to be attempting nothing more than a holding action, as if he awaited something. The night elf cursed himself for a fool. Of course Archimond awaited something, or rather, someone, his lord Sargeras. And if the archdemon believed that the arrival of the Legion's master was still imminent, that did not bode well for those who had gone to take the demon soul and seal the portal. For a moment, Jared's nerve failed him, but then his expression hardened and he fought with even more fervor. It would not be due to any lacking on his part if the defenders failed. His people, his world, would certainly fall if the host faltered now. Jared could only hope that Krasis, Malfurion, and the others would somehow still succeed in their mission. Overhead, dragons continued to soar past in search of the enemy, or to aid those in the host under the most stressed. To the commander's right, earthen chopped their way through demoralized Felguard, a furbolg battered in the skull of a fell beast. It all looked so hopeful, Jared thought, aware that it was anything but. He saw a band of Holmes people slicing their way through the opposition. With them rode a party of the priestesses of Elune, and Jared noticed his sister Maev at their head. It did not at all surprise him to see her up at the front, although he quietly worried for her. There would be no dragging her from the battle. He had concluded that Maev was trying to prove herself to the rest of her sect so that they would correct what she clearly thought an oversight and make her high priestess. Whether or not such ambition was permitted in the moon goddess's order was debatable, but Maev was Maev. Astride the third nightsaber he had ridden this day, Jared gutted a tusked warrior. His own armor hung ragged on him, so damaged had it gotten from the blows of his adversaries. There were at least half a dozen wounds spread out over his body, but none thankfully life-threatening or even overly draining. Jared could rest when the battle was over or when he was dead. 
Then, cries broke out from the direction of the torrent. The night elf watched in horror. Several of Holm's kind burned as if some violent... Violent? Oops. Oh, what? that's jumped me back a whole chapter. Or more? Dang it. Sorry, guys. I pushed backspace and that shot me on. Okay. Okay. Astride the third night saber he had ridden this day. Oh, I, that, that's the back. The night elf watched in horror as several of Holm's kind burned as if some virulent acid had been poured over them. Their hair sizzled and their flesh melted away in clumps. That's what it was. I, I think I, I couldn't tell if it was violent or virulent, but... The priestesses tried to aid them, but a surge of fell guard barreled over the foremost females. The demons cared not whether an adversary was male or female. They impaled Torin and beheaded priestesses with utter savagery. Jared knew that he should stay where he was, but Maev, whatever her faults, was his only family. He cared for her far more than he dared show. Quickly making certain that his own area would not fall victim once he departed, the commander forced his mount around and headed for the horrific scene. A few Torrens still stood, some of them badly injured but able to wield their spears and axes. They and the survivors of Maev's band stood all but encircled by demons. Even before he had ridden halfway, Jared watched two more of the defenders perish under the onslaught. Then Maev slipped. A looming fell guard swung at her. She managed to deflect his attack, but just barely. With a howl, Jared rode his mount into the struggle. His cat took down the demon attacking his sister. Another demon slashed at him, instead catching the animal on the shoulder. Jared ran his blade through his foe's throat. The demon suddenly focused on Jared. It had not occurred to him that they might know who he was, but their determination suggested just that. They ignored other viable targets just to reach the commander. His nightsaber took down two more, but then suffered several deep wounds from lances. On foot, Jared would have a great disadvantage over so many towering figures, yet there was nothing he could do. Three more lances finished the noble animal, and it was all Jared could do to leap off or be trapped underneath its carcass. He landed in a crouching position next to his sister, who for the first time seemed to realize the identity of her would-be rescuer. Jared, you shouldn't have come. They need you. Stop commanding for once and get behind me. He shoved his sister unceremoniously to the rear, just as two horned figures closed on him. Despite his good fortune so far, Jared Shadowsong had little belief that his small sword would be any ma match for their two massive blades. But as he readied himself for his final battle, a horn sounded and the area was suddenly a swarm with soldiers and Torin. Holm crashed into the two demons, beheading one and crushing in the chest of the other, before the pair could realize that they were under assault. A cloaked figure rode past one Jared belatedly recognized as Lord Black Forest. Oh. Wait, who's Lord Black Forest? I think that was his friend, or like the noble that one was kind of like his new mini second in command. There could only be one explanation for their sudden arrival. They'd seen Jared riding into struggle and believed in him enough to come to his aid. The reinforcements shoved back the Burning Legion, buying Jared and Maya of time. He dragged her further from the fight, the remaining sisters following close behind. Jared made her sit on a rock. Maev, eyes speculative, studied her younger brother. Jared, she started. You can reprimand me later, sister, he snapped. I won't stand behind while those who follow me face the enemy in my name. I was not going to reprimand. It was as far as the priestess got before he was out of earshot. With his sister at least temporarily secure, Jared concerned himself only with his comrades. Even Black Forest, one of the most prominent of the nobles, fought hard. He and his ilk had managed to learn from Lord Star-Eye's mistakes. This was a battle for survival, not a game for the amusement of the high castes. Coming up on Holm, Jared lunged at the demon seeking the Torrent's side. Holm noticed the action and gave the knight off an appreciative snort. I will carve your name on my spear, he rumbled. You will be honored by generations of my line. I'd be honored just to live through this. Oh, such wisdom in one so young. A female dragon of Alexstrasza's flight swooped down, laying a cleansing blast of red flame that forever doused many green ones. The action further eased the situation for Jared's contingent. The commander of the host began to breathe just a little easier. 
But a second later, the same dragon went careening back beyond the night elves' lines, her chest a sizzling mass of ruined scale and torn innards. The earth shook as she collided with it, and a furtive look by Jared gave him ample enough evidence to know that she would not fly again. And in the wake of the Leviathan's death, a dozen soldiers also flew back, their bodies charred. Demons, too, tumbled, as if whatever attack did not care who perished, so long as nothing stood in its path. Holm put a protective arm across Jared's chest. What comes is no infernal or the work of the Eridar. I believe it seeks that a massive wind tossed fighters from both forces aside as if they were nothing. Night sabers were no less immune. Black forced in his mount, thrown with the rest. Holm managed to stand his ground a second longer, but even the stubbornness of a tauren could not hold against the incredible gale. He went flying past, the warriors striking at the wind in frustration as he vanished from sight. Yet Jared's shadow song felt nothing, not even a breeze. And so he found himself alone when the giant strode out of the dust raised by the wind, the giant with dark skin and intricate tattoos that even the unskilled Jared could sense radiated sinister magical forces. Yes, mused the figure eyeing the night elf up and down. If I cannot have the druid, I shall amuse myself on what pathetically passes as the hope of this doomed host. Jared readied his blade aware that he had no hope against this opponent, but finding himself unwilling to surrender to the inevitable. Await you, Archmond. The archdemon laughed. <laughs> okay, um... So we're three quarters of the way done with this book. We're rounding up near the end. We only have a few, a handful of chapters to go, and there are still some major plot points that we know need to happen. So here's what my prediction is that's still to come. There needs to be a climax at the well itself, somehow, some way, that results in a catastrophic explosion. Um, I think it's going to involve all the players that they've congregated around there. Um, this explosion needs to render, needs to sunder the world. There needs to be a massive sundering of the world. So that's another plot point. Like that actually occurring and the immediate impact of that needs to happen. And then we need the requisite one to two beats of um, like aftermath. Because if you if ever there was a novel that needed an after an aftermath chapter or two, it would be one in which the entire world was sundered. So um, I would imagine we're going to need one to two minimum chapters to get all that in order. And if it if this follows the trend, and it might not of the previous couple books, the aftermath chap uh, the final chapter is small. So that would bring us up to the two to three ranks. So that gives us one to two more chapters of showdown here. Um, they've obviously set us up for a decent one here. So let me make a. Here's I'm gonna I'm gonna say the final three chapters are, are aftermath, sundering, the cataclysmic explosion, and then uh, so, and, and then one showdown. So my guess is next chapter is gonna be the final showdown, and then the one after that will be where we finally have everything come to a head. That's my humble prediction with the one after that being part two of that where the world itself is sundered. All right, let's see if I'm right. You guys will be around here for part of that journey. So again, easy prediction and it's based off this, doesn't take a genius, is that the next one will, will be our showdowns of various types, not just, sure, Archimonde will be in there, but we'll also have some other showdowns. This is my prediction for the next chapter. Okay, you guys. Uh, another episode in the pipes, five by five. I look forward to finding out if my predictions are right. Catch you on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft. Thank you, as always.